You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. That's not a recipe for success. Those people didn't have success at what they were doing. Uh, they were gambling. And if you're just looking for somebody that on the internet, like myself or yourself, Bill, to just give you a stock tip, we may be right, we may be wrong, but that's not a recipe for long-term success. Success in this business is done through study, recognition of patterns, and emotional stability that allows you to get through the inevitable volatility. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and we're going to be hearing from a new guest today. I'm speaking with John Palami. His website is actionableintelligencealert.com. That's actionableintelligencealert.com. And if you're listening on audio podcast only, I'm going to put a link to that website in the description. John also has a new a resource sector focused newsletter. On Twitter, you can find him at John Polomy. That's P O L O M N Y. And he has over 3,000 followers right there on Twitter. So, John, welcome to Mining Stock Education. I, I appreciate you joining me. I've watched a, a number of your YouTubes and I've appreciated your calculated, non emotionally dri driven, strategic approach to resource investing from what I've heard. And that's why I reached out to you. So let's start off with you giving a little more background of yourself so listeners can get familiar with you. How did you become a resource investor? So I've been attracted to uh, mining and playing in the dirt and oil exploration. I don't know. I just have a fascination with these uh, industries since I was a kid. Um, the people that were involved in it. I've read about, when I was a kid, I read about mining booms in, in California during the gold rush and the uranium mining boom that they had in Utah in the 50s and 60s and just the whole history of the oil industry. It's just fascinated me how these guys that uh, would take these huge risks and go out into the field and and um, just lay it all on the line and and go for it. And some of these, most of them were not successful, but there were a handful that we know about uh, that were extremely successful, and I just uh, had a fascination with it. So I've been um, – I got introduced early on to the writings of Doug Casey, which everybody probably knows who this is, and uh, was fascinated with um, a lot of his uh, views around politics and economics appealed to me. But then uh, also kind of got into that whole sphere. This is pre-internet now when we're talking about paper newsletters and the whole, um, you know, uh, the ability to, you know, the guy never worked a job. He was a professional speculator his whole life. And it just appealed to me. And uh, I think when the internet came about, it was uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me. He's somebody that's a voracious uh, consumer of information. I was just able then to connect with other people and gather information and read about all these different uh, projects and uh, uh, potentials, uh, all the things that I had uh, seen before. Now I could get online and get with other folks that kind of were the same way. And, and so I, I kind of got drawn into it that way. I've been investing my whole life um, and had various levels of success. But uh, the reason I was kind of really drawn to resource investing in particular is, is that uh, – once you understand the cyclicality of the business and the volatility that's involved, a tremendous amount of wealth can be possibly um, manufactured if you can get those things right. Not many people can, though, and so it's been a challenge over the last 20 years to figure that out. And I think I've got to the point now in my, in my career where I've been able to um, unemotionally uh, observe the cyclicality and uh, – make volatility my friend as rick rule says so uh that's kind of my uh long uh winding way to uh where i'm at now john we're at a very unique place in society and in the markets where companies can declare bankruptcy and then go parabolic on the heels of it we also got uh an inflow of what they say are robin hood traders now young people for the young people or old people who are newer to the resource sector and are listening to us, what would be some of the key advice or warnings that you would give to new resource investors? Well, if you're going to get into the resource market, one of the first things I think you should do is really educate yourself. And that's kind of hard to do because this industry is filled with, it has some very good people and it has a lot of people that are don't have your best interests in 
as their first motivation. And what I encourage people to do, if you're going to get serious about being involved in the resource markets, you should take the time to go to one of the conferences that they give in Vancouver. You can pick any one of them. They're pretty much all the same. And you should go there and just go there with an unbiased mind. And you will see um, speakers that you will see mining companies. You will see project generators. You'll see all kinds of people there. And you will notice that they all are very positive people about their projects. They, they feel that their project is going to be the next whatever biggest copper, gold, uranium mine, whatever. And I think, you know, the reason you should experience this is because the facts are not consistent with what you will see in here. The facts are that very few projects or pieces of dirt or claims actually ever become a viable mine that's able to uh, produce a return for shareholders. Um, a lot of returns are given, though, to the managements and promoters and newsletter writers and a lot of other ancillary uh, industries that are supported uh, by the quest to uh, get minerals out of the ground. I mean, it's a known, this is one of the things that's, that people don't really think about in the resource market. They just have visions of sugar plums and they don't understand the, what's required uh, uh, to bring a asset to uh, production. I mean, mining is a terrible business to be in. It's not a very good business. It destroys capital in many cases. Um, that's why you have to really understand the cyclical nature of the various resources or commodities. You can't just, these are not buy and hold investments. You can't just buy these stocks and hold them. You have to understand the cyclical nature of the particular uh, resource. You then have to find, uh, you have to get your timing right. And then you have to be emotionally stable enough and rational enough to ride through the various um, ups and downs. I mean, within the space of a year, a resource stock, even in a bull market, can fluctuate to the downside 40, 50 percent and still be up for the year. Uh, that's in a bull market. In a bear market for a particular resource, uh, these things can go down 90 or 99 percent without uh, without even thinking. So I think that uh, a lot of people get into this with visions of sugar plums and themselves on a beach somewhere in the, in the um, Caribbean. And a tremendous amount of people have made a lot of – or a lot of wealth has been created by some folks. And I think it's a good idea to study, uh, you know, success leaves clues. And studying what the successful have done will lead you to understand that a lot of the wealth was created by getting yourself at the table on private placements and also understanding cyclicality. If you're a retail investor, that's your only hope is to have the information advantage and to understand cyclicality and volatility. And not to go too long, uh, but one of the things I encourage a lot of people to do, one of my heroes of this, and you know all the big names in this industry everybody talks about, but there's a, a management team that I'm very – uh, I met them a long time ago. I'm very um, respectful of them. I think they got it down. They understand it. And that's LTS Minerals, Brian Dalton, and that group over there. If people go to their website and they have a presentation where they talk about how they created their business, how they took advantage of low points in cyclical, uh, the cyclical lows recently to really build up their royalty portfolio, and you will now note how they are um, – uh, harvesting the gains from the ability to beef up their royalty portfolio during uh, the low point in the previous cycle. So I think that's a perfect demonstration or manifestation of how this business should be run. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are attracted to promoters and in the best story. And, and believe me, there's stories can be told very, very convincingly. So yeah, that's the advice I would give to a lot of young guys coming to this business. There's successful people that are serially successful, and you should really look at the clues that they le left and how they uh, were able to achieve that uh, success. John, uh, in this last week, we actually had a podcast that was focused on LTS Minerals, who, by the way, is not a sponsor of the show, and I, I don't own a position in that company right now. But I had a fund manager come on and just talk through for 25, 30 minutes his investment thesis for why he invested in that company. And part of the purpose from a didactic or educational standpoint was so that especially the newer investors or more educated that are listening to us could 
here are the process, the thinking process for an investment thesis in the resource sector because sometimes I've gotten messages saying, just tell me what stocks to buy. I'm going to devote this amount of money. You just tell me what stocks to buy or a comment like that shows up in the YouTube uh, channel comments and that's not my goal. You know, you could give somebody a fish or you could teach them to fish. So when you are talking about actionable intelligence, just by listening to you, I can tell you don't want to just tell people to buy a stock. That's not what your newsletters are right about. But what does it mean for you when you're giving out information and you're giving out actionable intelligence in this sector? When we're talking about different uh, resource sectors or investments or speculations in general, I mean, what I try to do is I look at the world for what it is, not what I want it to be. And I try to look at what the trends are or I mean, I'm not trying to do top down economic analysis, but I'm trying to look at what am I where am I currently at? What, how, where, where, where do I find myself? What reality am I in? And where do I anticipate uh, based on historical precedents, based on human nature, based on psychology, um, where I think things are going to go in the future and then try to find actionable uh, investments or speculations that will allow me to take advantage of that, whether that's in the resource market. I mean, we're focusing on resources, but that can be in anything. So, I mean, the problem I think a lot of people have, and I saw this even during, uh, just to give an example, uh, during the previous administration, uh, the, the Obama administration, we had the 2008 stock market crash. The S&P ended up at uh, like 666, I think it was the low. And once the Federal Reserve came into the market, it was apparent that they were going to create whatever levels of, of currency units or money, if you will, dollars, in order to support uh, or try to um, stem the de deflationary impulse that had been created. And that, from a historical precedent, meant that you were probably going to be looking at, you know, stock prices going higher. But I knew many people that just refused to even consider going back into the stock market, not because they were scared, but they just had a personal animus against the particular president. Now, I'm apolitical. I don't really care one way or another. But... I said, you know, I'll go back to the old Marty Zweig way of thinking, you know, don't fight the Fed and three, you know, th three cuts and, and, and you're off to the races with the Fed funds rate. It was obvious what was going to happen. So people allow a lot of biases to enter their uh, thinking when it comes to investing or speculating. And um, I think that is something that you need to per people need to before they get involved with this, because you're dealing with money here. You're trying to create a return on your capital. If you want to give money to a particular political organization, if you want to go staple a piece of cardboard to a stick and protest against, that's great. You should do that. But you have to be able to separate that from your resource uh, investing or speculating or your investing in particular because it has no place. Um, I remember being at a picnic with family members and they asked me, you know, this is many years, right at the bottom, I think, of the uh, uranium, when uranium was selling like $17, what's a good investment. I said, well, I think, you know, the uranium, I give a three minute spiel on why I think uranium is a good thing. Well, I would never invest in uranium. That's, that's nuclear power. Yeah. So you do realize that nuclear power contributes 20% of the United States' uh, electricity. They're just people are just unaware. So they just have this bias against it. I'm not biased in that way. So um, and it took me a while to get out of that mode. So I, I suggest that people look at their biases. They look at their thinking. You have to approach this unemotional especially in resource speculation because of the swings and the volatility. Um, and you can't allow yourself to get swayed by a slick presentation or something you just hear. Um, I learned that when I used to raise race greyhounds, I used to go to the track. I never bet on the greyhounds. I supplied the dogs. Uh, I was part in some partnerships and I would see these, to your point, these degenerate gamblers, they would find these tip sheets and it's just like, give me the winning dog. Well, that's not a recipe for success. Those people, didn't have success at what they were doing. Uh, they were gambling. And if you're just looking for somebody that on the internet, like myself or yourself, Bill, to just give you a stock tip, uh, we may be right, we may be wrong, but that's not a recipe for long-term success. Success in this business is done through study, recognition of patterns, 
and emotional stability that allows you to get through the inevitable volatility. That's my view, at least. John, you have a background. You're a, a veteran of the military, so thank you for your military service to our country. But I assume that has also caused you to control your emotions perhaps better than others. When it comes to your emotions and not making investment buy or sell decisions purely based on emotion, but rather on reason and a calculated expectation, what do you do, even with whatever maturity level emotionally you've achieved, do you do to check yourself outside of your own ability to manage yourself in this area? So when I make a uh, commitment to commit funds to an investment or speculation, and I differentiate those two, but when I do that, I have a trading notebook. I write down the reasons, the bullet points, the thoughts, the notes for a particular position, and I... I, I, I study it and then I try to go back. I might have two or three, four reasons why I'm getting for uranium, for example, why I think it's going to be long-term bullish. And then I try to poke holes in that over time. I revisit my thesis. I go back and look at it and I say, I call it uh, red teaming, like in the military when you have these drills or you have uh, war games, you have the opposing side that's trying to uh, beat you and, and, and constantly poke holes in your plan. So that's what I try to do. I try to take the opposite side and say, where am I wrong? I try to seek out uh, other people. Uh, that's why the internet's great. You know, I don't try to get confirmation bias. And I'm, everybody's susceptible to this. I'm not like Dr. Spock that's not immune to emotion. you got to constantly battle this so that I don't get confirmation bias or go just seek out people that are going to confirm my idea. I'm always looking for to poke holes in it. And that's one of the ways that I do it. You have to write this down. You have to revisit it. You have to know why you own something because the volatility, that's when the stomach churning starts. You buy something, um, it goes, inevitably it goes down 30% within a, a month and you're sitting there going, why did I buy this? And if you did it because I told you to do it in, in a YouTube comment or something, um, you're going to get, you're going to sell out for a loss. And if that's your way of doing that, you're not going to understand. You know, I kind of use the analogy. And Buffett talks about this, I believe. You know, if you like tuna fish and you are like to eat tuna fish sandwiches, and that's your favorite lunch item, and they sell for a dollar a can, then you go to the grocery store and they're selling for 50 cents a can, you're probably going to load up on tuna fish. So I think that, uh, you know, if you are involved in a company that, a mining company, for example, that's cash flowing, and you feel that the commodity price is moving higher, and it gets caught up in a general market downdraft like happened a few months ago, Nothing, there's several mining companies that I own that are cash flowing, doing well, and I stepped in and bought more because they weren't necessarily were gold mining companies. They didn't necessarily reflect, uh, even though the gold price had dropped off. It was my view that it was just going to be, you know, when the stock market goes down like that, 90% of the stocks go down, even, you know, resource stocks. That's an example. Nothing really changed with the particular businesses except for they got cheaper and that was an opportunity to buy, and then there was a subsequent rebound. Um, now, if you buy something and you have a reason that it's waiting to get a permit or something, and the permit doesn't come through, uh, um, well, then you have to revisit your thesis. There's a reason why the stock probably dropped 50%. You can't thesis change. People have a tendency to do what they call thesis creep. They'll look for another reason to keep holding it because they think that they want to get back to even. And what they should really do, you know, if you have a 50% loss, a 50% gain doesn't get you back to even. You need a 100% gain. So the best thing to do is if the thesis changes, sell out and move on. Uh, because in this business, um, you know, if you're even successful 30% of the time or even 20% of the time, as long as you hold those winners, you're going to be in a position for 100% of gains, sometimes over a th thousands of percent if you hit the right uh, company. And that will more than make up for the losses that you have. But just have to play the long game and you have to understand that I've seen people that just hold things they go down to. I was guilty of this early in my career. It's going to come back. No, I didn't really understand why I own the position. Then it blew up on you and it just like fossilizes in your, in your, in your brokerage account. So you can't, can't allow that to happen. You have a background in the ener energy industry, John. So when you see what happened in oil with oil going negative $42 as we chat, crude is about $35. So there's been a huge rebound, but that even at that price, it's not economic for many producers. If you were going to buy an oil stock today, what characteristics would that oil company have? So 
Um, I'm actually have a couple oil stocks that, uh, and I'm going to be recommending another one that's coming up. Um, I'm looking for companies that have large reserve bases in secure areas. Um, that there's many companies that have hedged a lot of their production already for 2020, well before um, the crisis took took over, and are even hedged into 2021. I know of one that's completely hedged for this year, so their cash flow really hasn't changed. My suspicion is that uh, low prices do cure low prices, and this would be a, I mean, a whole hour, several hour discussion of, of but the quick deal is, is that we've had the shale phenomenon in the U.S. has really sucked up all the oxygen and capital and has really, um, I believe, is a manifestation of cheap money and a desire for higher yields. I think that that has now, um, that mindset's changed regardless if the oil price comes back. Uh, and I think that there's been tremendous underinvestment in non-OPEC conventional resources around the world that is going to bite the world in the butt. I am not one of these people that thinks oil's going away. Um, even with, and I think, you know, even with this COVID thing and shutting down the world economy, yes, oil oil's demand still only dropped from about 100 million barrels a day to whether you want to believe Goldman Sachs or 70, 80 million barrels a day. And that's with everybody locked up. So that tells you how how inculcated into our economy oil is and the derivatives of oil. So I think that I'm looking to Asia, I'm looking to the emerging and frontier markets. You know, this is a spreadsheet exercise, even if they get to per capita usage in India, China, Malaysia, or Indonesia, the Philippines, these places of even South Korea, you would have to like double oil production over the next 20 years. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, so I think that there's going to be inevitable price rises. Um, I'm not one that views uh, hydrocarbons are going away anytime soon, um, regardless of what uh, a lot of other folks think. I think that's going to surprise a lot of folks. Uh, and I think that there's been tremendous underinvestment in uh, production. These things, these projects take many, many years and uh, to to put online, especially offshore and uh in, in other places, and the investment just hasn't been made. So I think long life reserves, people that are running their business, they don't have a lot of debt. Those companies do exist. And uh, I think that uh, in the next couple of years, I think the oil price is going to surprise a lot of people to the upside. So you would invest in coal, oil, and uranium companies then as part of your thesis? Well, I mean, when we talk about coal, that's a very interesting concept. I mean, coal is kind of like in the... Um, four-letter word category or is treated like a tobacco stock or tobacco industry, which, by the way, over the last 20 years, uh, the best returns in the stock market uh, on a compounded basis were like Altera and, the, and, the, and these tobacco companies. People don't understand that. Even though smokings went down, it kills 400,000 people a year. They had tens of billion dollars of uh, settlements with the government about 10 years ago, and still they were some of the best performing companies. And I bifurcate coal between thermal coal and met coal. Metallurgical coal, of course, is used to make coke, which is used in the uh, oxygen blast furnace uh, type steel making, which represents about 70, around 70% 70 of current steel making. So metallurgical coal is a necessary component for civilization. Uh, we need steel. Um, when you make steel uh, and you use it to build a bridge, the bridge doesn't last forever. Same thing in foundations or you see roads or whatever. You see the rebar. And I think people uh, underappreciate that. So I think uh, there's tremendous value right now in a lot of the met metallurgical coal stocks. Um, I'm looking seriously at those. Would I stay away from thermal coal? Uh, I would right now. Uh, thermal coal obviously used electri electricity generation. However, it's not really going away either. Even if you look at countries like Germany, which had a big push for renewables, uh, they shut down their nuclear power plants after the Fukushima incident, and now they've been forced to build a lot of coal plants. And one of the th strangest phenomenon you will see is, on one hand, the German government and body politic pushing this renewable energy transition, they call it. I can't pronounce the word in German, but they've spent $500 billion on this. And yet, if you go on and, and uh, put in a YouTube search or Google search, German lignite coal mining, surface mining, you'll see these huge bucket miners that are just ripping apart the landscape to get this coal out of the ground, tearing up, you know, villages that are 500 years old and old growth forests. 
I think the, there's a little bit of hypocrisy there and in, in uninformed uh, uh, folks. But yes, I think around energy, I think natural gas, oil, uranium uh, are going to, I think uranium's obviously in a renaissance. Uh, people that are rational around the world, if you really look at like emerging markets and frontier markets or places that are industrializing like China and India, they have huge build programs going on. Um, do they have some renewable projects? Yes, they have renewable going on too. But for a base load, folks understand, um, I think in the West, we're, I don't want to get too political here, but we're kind of contaminated our thinking with a lot of uh, political correctness and wishful thinking. Uh, I think people that are uh, thinking clearly and want energy diversification for their economy consider nuclear power as the cornerstone of a base load uh, um, electrical generation. So, yeah, I'm very high on uh, uranium mining. Do you focus on gold in, in precious metal stocks also in your letter? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, gold, I mean, look what's going on, Bill. I mean, I mean, we have, we're in unprecedented times. We talk about debt in the world. It's not going, there, real quick, there's really three ways you can get rid of this debt, right? You can have an outright default, which isn't going to happen. It's not politically, people talk about these debt jubilees. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, uh, you can pay it back. That's not going to happen. The, the, the debts are so large now. The the cash flows from the economies are not sufficient. Or you can do with this going back to the historical narrative. You can inflate them away, and that is the most political expedient and the way things have been done throughout history. If you go all the way back to Roman times, they used to just clip the coins, make the coins smaller, and make more coins. That was inflating the money supply. That's what we're doing now. So, um, without get, you know, this is, these are two hour conversations, but you know. I think gold, men have to go into the, it's been used for money. Why? Because men have to go into the ground and physically tear it from the earth and it cannot be inflated away by you know, hitting a hitting an enter button on a, on a laptop. So uh, I think things of scarcity is going to come back. Uh, I think things that uh, if you can't mine it or farm it, uh, you don't have it. That's one of my things I'm, I'm a big on saying. And I think in our modern society, we've forgotten that. Now we see, I think a lot of, you know, in the 2020s, we're seeing a lot of rejection, I think, now of globalism, intertwined economies. Like, I think we're going to see resource nationalism. All these things are going to contribute. Plus, like I said, this debt burden, especially in the West, that's not going to be reconciled except through, you know, monetizing of the debt. I mean, we just, I, I didn't think we would see what we saw in the last three months where we've seen just a complete, I mean, what, they, what the Treasury and the Fed have done have basically just, you know, circumvented all laws and you know, it's I, I call it crossing the rubicon it's like havenstein in the reichsbank in the 20s when they made a decision just to continue to print money to pay their war debts once you cross the rubicon there's no coming back and i believe we've crossed the rubicon i think gold and even bitcoin is something to look at to preserve your your wealth yes i, I think it's going to do very well in the next uh, 10 years well thank you for coming on today's show to share your insights more of john's insights and information about his subscription service can be found at actionableintelligencealert.com i'll also put a link to both john's youtube channel and his twitter feed and in the show notes below so john as i as i just said thank you so much for coming on today's show and sharing your insights with us really appreciate it bill